Hello, and welcome to worship at St. Paul School of Theology. My name is Casey Sigmund. This is by Lillian Sigmund. She says hello. Uh, and as professor of preaching and worship, I get to serve as the director of chapel at St. Paul. By now, we are surely feeling the momentum of another semester. For some, it is momentum on a momentum, piled upon momentum as we continue to live our ordinary lives in momentous times. Equipping us for this work is our guest preacher, Reverend Dr. Tex Sample. Dr. Sample is a pastor of Trinity UMC and chair of our St. Paul Board of Trustees. Dr. Sample taught at St. Paul for 32 years as Robert B. and Kathleen Rogers, Professor of Church and Society. Also leading us today in worship is our spring musician in residence, Odell Talley. Affectionately called Talley or Bishop, this anointed musician, songwriter, singer, and director's humble beginnings are rooted just down the street in Kansas City, Kansas at the Shiloh Baptist Church. Today, Tally is director of music for Swope Parkway United in Kansas City, Missouri. He is also an organist for Zion Travelers Missionary Baptist of Kansas City, Kansas. In other venues, he is lead keyboardist and musical director for the Groove Agency Band, Caribbean Steel Jamaican Band, and TG2 Theatrical Production Staff Manager of KCP MAA, and a staff organist for the Dwayne E. Harvey Director's Funeral Chapel and Serenity Funeral Home. And with all of these adventures going on, we are so blessed to have Odell Tali join our worship team this semester. As we prepare to enter into worship, let us join together now in the spirit of the living God is near to us as our own breath. Let us pray. And so we breathe you in deeply, Holy One. We breathe in your breath that entered into the dirt and set us in motion, that stirred up dry bones, entered their lungs, resurrected their life, that entered into Mary's womb and sparked a song of your justice through her son. Justice for the oppressed and captive, the weak, the small, we breathe. The breath Jesus offered to his disciples to give them peace behind doors locked for fear of what is to come. We breathe your spirit, God, Yahweh. And though we are scattered, we are gathered now in you as your son, Jesus Christ's body for the ongoing work of justice and healing that is co-requisite with the joyful kingdom of God. We breathe and we offer to you with our breath, our song, our praise, our worship of you, God, our devotion to the way of Jesus by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In conversation, we've heard that uh, clergy gets tired and gets weak and gets wore down too, all right? You got social issues, you got economic issues, you got health issues, you got political issues, you got you issues. And so we're still wrapped up into this pandemic and all the things that comes with it. But God knows that we are sure that God has borne our griefs and he has carried our sorrows. So I just want to let you know that you can make it. You can make it. This trial you going through. God's going to show you what to do. You can make it. You can make it. Going on, God won't let it last too 
alone. You're not in this thing alone. You can make it. And as God permitted his soul for Jesus to pray for us in the Garden of Gethsemane, I pray for you. You pray for me. Watch God change things. Be encouraged. I pray for you. You pray for me. Watch God change things. Even a cold gets worse at night. But in the morning, I pray for you. You pray for me. Watch God change things. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. And we want to just leave you with this too. excuse me, extensive, we want to go into a request and a prelude before he comes up. And we all know this hymn. Feel free to join in your hearts. And sing along with us. Great is thy faithfulness, O Lord, my Father. There is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changes not, thy compassions fail not. As thou Thou forever will be. Great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, mercies I see. Oh, I am need. Your hand has pulled my hand. Great is thy 
faithfulness, oh Lord, unto me, summer and winter, springtime and harvest, sun, moon, and stars in their courses above. Oh, and with all nature, manifold with men, to thy great faithfulness, mercy. faithful unto you. Let me say how privileged I feel to be here uh, and to participate in this chapel service. I love this school and uh, I'm just terribly grateful to be here. We have scripture this morning from Philippians and from Luke. Let me read first the text from Philippians, be chapter four, four through nine. Paul writes, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say, rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Do not worry about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be known to God and the peace of God, which passes all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, beloved, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence and if there's anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Keep on doing the things that you have learned and received and heard and seen in me and the God of peace will be with you. And then from the gospel of Luke chapter 12 verses eight through 12. And I tell you, everyone who acknowledges me before others, the son of man also will acknowledge before the angels of God. But whoever denies me before others will be denied before the angels of God. And everyone who speaks a word against the son of man will be forgiven. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. When they bring you before the synagogues, the rulers and the authorities, do not worry about how you are to defend yourselves or what you are to say. For the Holy Spirit will teach you at that very hour what you ought to say. May God bless this reading of the sacred word. Wolfgang Strake is an economic sociologist. In 2016, he wrote a book entitled How Capitalism Will End. Not whether, but how. It's a foregone conclusion to him that it will end. The Financial Times, a conservative journal, said that his book was the most important book written during that year. Let me just share with you some of the basic 
thoughts that he wrote. He argued that capitalism is dying basically from its own successes with nothing to take its place. He said capitalism is no longer able to provide an economy of growth and a stable society. He said we face an unfuture, an uncertain future and a long time of decline and languish. And then note this, he said that the shotgun marriage between capitalism and democracy is ending. That we are seeing now the rise of oligarchy, the rule of the few, and plutocracy, the rule of the rich. He said, one citizen, one vote has now become one dollar, one vote. And that there is an endemic conflict between capitalist markets and democratic societies. In other words, they are becoming mutually exclusive. You don't have the capitalist markets of today and democracy. He argued that this leads to widespread despair, alienation, and individualized responses that threaten the very basis of functioning societies. He named our responses, our answers, to these threats as coping, hoping, doping, and shopping. I would want to suggest to you that a great deal of the unrest we see in our society today is related directly to this kind of economic development and the impact it's having on democracy. I believe the people who attacked our national capital on January 6 were dead wrong, engaged in criminal activity. At the same time, I want to say that while they've got the reasons wrong, they are responding to some very important consequences that are affecting their lives and the lives of so many more, especially those in the bottom half of our class structure. And I mean by that people of color who suffer disproportionately. I mean by women who suffer disproportionately and by the white working class, which has seen a decline in its status, its income, and its well-being now. Let me do one other piece and then we'll move to the text. Eric Alterman recently reported the conclusions of five political scientists. These are not marginal political scientists. These are people who do extraordinarily important and creditable work. First of all, Martin Gillens and Benjamin Page, they studied 1700, actually more than 1700 policy decisions. And what they found made by our governments and what they found that economic elites and organized interest groups that includes corporations largely owned and controlled by wealthy elites, that they play a substantial part in affecting public policy. But the general public has little or no independent influence. In fact, they found that flesh and blood Americans have a statistically non-significant impact on public policy. Listen to the research of Alexander Hertel Fernandez, of Mato Mildenberger and Leah Stokes. They found that congressional staffers, and by extension, the people who cover them in the media, believe that their constituents are far more conservative than they really are and act accordingly. That's because the people they hear from and respond to are the wealthy and big corporate America. Third, Citizens United and the research done for them by Stan Ablad Zia. He found that dark money groups have grown far more influential in shaping the ideological agenda of political parties. 
He says, given the fact that the vast majority of this funding is directed by extremely conservative sources, and they say most famously, but hardly exclusively, the Koch Brothers Network. This phenomenon, rather than the preferences of the GOP, is responsible for the takeover of the Republican Party by hard right extremists. Or listen to Sanford Schramm and Richard Fording. They did an examination of the political knowledge of more than 3,000 Fox News viewers. They found that relying on Fox News as a major source, major news source, significantly decreased a person's score more than relying on any other news source. And they point out that not surprisingly, people vote on the basis of these misrepresentations. Finally, listen to Gregory Martin and Ali Yurikoglu, who's an economist. They found that the effect of watching Fox News was powerful enough to change the results of almost any close election. And even some that would never have been close without it. And they point out that voters are motivated, are motivated by media misinformation. What am I trying to suggest? I'm trying to suggest that we are facing an enormously difficult situation in our country. The circumstances are not coming. They are here. We are seeing that the bottom half of the class structure, people of color, women, immigrants, others, are experiencing hardship brought on by the fact that we're seeing the loss of a democratic form of life. Now, I know that democracy has had all kinds of problems in the past, but what we're seeing now is a new gilded age. It may even be worse now than it was in the late 19th century. I think it is. So two comments, one from Luke and one from Philippians. Let me remind you that Luke is addressing here the fact that the church is undergoing persecution, probably writing in the 80s. The church is undergoing very, very, very difficult times. And uh, if you remember in Matthew and Mark, when, when they talk about blasphemy, they're talking about people who assert that Jesus is committing satanic acts. But let me say that in Luke, it's different. In Luke, what he is addressing is the witness of the church. And he's saying that when people of the church do not speak the truth of Christ, they are committing blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, that when we do not speak the truth of Christ, we are not true witnesses. Now, I want to say this, that when Luke talks about that, there is no question for him about the power of the Holy Spirit, the way in which the Holy Spirit moves in our lives, moves in history, moves in the church. No question about that. In fact, the Spirit of God is the hallmark of the church, and it's by God's Spirit that the church lives and worships, and folks hear that, witnesses. Where is the witness of the church about the harm being done to that great mass of people in our society who are being so powerfully burdened by the inequalities that are attacking their lives? Fred Craddock puts it this way. If therefore the church capitulates to pressure and persecution to the point of blaspheming its own life giving spirit, no alternative for life is available. Let me remind you too that in Luke, he has a special concern for victims of oppression. 
Notice how the prominence of women prevails throughout that gospel. Notice his abiding concern for the poor and his conviction that poverty is the result of injustice. There's no question about that in Luke. Yes, and, and his view of the rich who will be sent empty away and the rich in Luke as fools. You see in Luke, the kingdom of God, the basileia of God, the commonwealth of God, the reign of God, it's a reversal of values. And folks, the work of the Holy Spirit is that presence and power in our lives, moving in our midst, calling us to be witnesses, to speak against the powers that hold our people in captivity. Notice Luke 12, just quickly. He says, whoever denies me before others will be denied before the angels of God. And that's coupled with whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit. Luke says they will not be forgiven. But notice what he says about witness. He says, when they bring you before the synagogues, now there was a conflict within the synagogues and between synagogues and the emerging church in Luke's day. But remember this too. He says, when they bring you before the synagogues, and then he adds, and I must confess, I had read this piece hundreds of times before I saw it. When they bring you before the synagogues, the rulers and the authorities, hmm, do not worry about how you are to defend yourselves or what you, to, what you are to say. The Holy Spirit will teach you at that very hour what you ought to say. Folks, we have rulers and authorities before whom we must witness, and we have them at this very hour. At this very hour. I think that the answer to that is the kind of organizing down on the ground of flesh and blood people who will call the captivities of our time into question and who will challenge those rulers and they, those authorities in behalf of the people of this country and of course of other countries as well. But I think an awful lot of our work has to start here. Think with me then quickly to physician, to Philippians. Let me remind you that in Philippians, the spirit is alive and in life, okay? But then we get these words, they seem crazy. They was saying, rejoice. Any of you in a mood to rejoice after what I've told you about what's going on, if it's true? Huh. And then Paul says this, uh, let your gentleness be known. He calls us not to worry about anything. He says by prayer and supplication. With thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. Whew. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds. Oh, it gets worse. Then listen. Paul says, whatsoever is true, honorable, just, pure, pleasing, commendable. If there is any excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Keep on doing the things that you've learned, received, and heard, and seen in me, says Paul. And then the God of peace will be with you. Where do you get that kind of naive stuff coming out of Paul? You know where it comes from? Jail. He's in jail. And I, I don't know if this, if this letter was written in the late 50s. He's, what, six or seven years from his own ex execution. If it was written in the early 60s, he's just three, four years from the capital punishment that Rome will bring against him. The interesting thing about most of the values he calls for here, the gentleness, the, the, uh, to be true and honorable and pure and pleasing, these are all in a very real sense, secular values in his world. They're the values that are held in common. And he's calling people to those, why? Is there some sense that he knows that the spirit moves in all of life? That it moves in the community of faith, yes, but beyond that community of faith. 
Is he calling for a witness that will address not only the issues of the church, the ecclesia, but also that wider community of people beyond our church? Friends, we need a witness in our time that can hear and respond to the moving of the Holy Spirit in life and in history. And it is a desperately important time for us to hear that word and to be a part of that response. In the 18th century, John Wesley instructed the Methodist colonies in Georgia not to participate in the slave trade. They were not to own slaves. Of course, he was not heeded. I think at least once a week of what would happen, what would have happened if those Methodist colonies had forbade slavery and stood against it in 18th century America, can you imagine what that witness would be now? Can you imagine what it would have meant then? Can you imagine what impact it could have had Friends, we have now a time before us that participates in that kind of gravity. And the Holy Spirit is still at work, waiting for those people who will not blaspheme against the work of the Spirit, but will claim those lives lived in justice and purity and in witness before the world. Could we now sing a reprieve of the hymn, Great is Our Faithfulness? All over the building, wherever you're at, let's join in solidarity with this in your home. Great is thy faithfulness Great is thy faithfulness, morning by morning, new mercy I see. Oh, I have needed your hand as for my death. Great is thy faithfulness, O Lord, unto thee. Great is thy faithfulness. A good word. <laughs> As Luke and Paul are writing, the fall of the Roman Empire is 400 years away. The domination of Rome continued through that time. And yet there was a witness there that lasts into this and these circumstances. Let us be a part of that witness to stand and to be the people of Christ. Amen.